I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm a, a square apartheid baby. I was born in 1944, um, when the British had already done their bits of separate development and job reservation, which the British had already had in place well before the Dutch came, um, which I, I didn't yet know at the time here. But the apartheid law started right at the beginning of the century when the British were in place. I was born in Kenya and I was about 15 when the family came over to the UK. I, th I suppose I was always aware in Kenya about the legacies of colonialism, but as a child you don't really filter it through in a way that's meaningful. You feel things. So there were occasions when I would notice things that I was really um, able to understand uh, what they meant. I did understand later once we came into the country, uh, into the UK, and um, I, my experiences were not great right at the beginning. Um, obviously, I had great family life, lots of love and nurturing great siblings, but I think the environment was particularly friendly towards people of colour. My dad is half Rosa. My mum is um, Dutch. Was the, My grandparents are Dutch. My grandfather was a Malaysian uh, slave, a uh, freed slave. Um, so we are very mixed. And if you look at the um, surnames in Cape Town, you'll find a mishmash of European names. Yeah? You really will. Very French, because the Huguenots went to settle there as well. Uh, even the roads. So, yes, a lot of uh, Dutch, but before that, right, in the 1400s, the Portuguese came and put their flag down. My parents um, were part of the boycott campaign. Um, so I was brought up, it was sort of drilled into me, do not ever buy South African goods. So one day, yeah, I was about five. Um, my mum was in a local shop and they had um, South African pilchards on sale, tin, tinned fish. Yeah. Um, and so she told the shopkeeper he shouldn't be selling them, he needs to take them off. And um, he refused. And then ensued a long argument. So my mum said to him, you know, you're Asian. If you were in South Africa, do you recognise how you would be treated and in, under the system of apartheid? And she started to talk to him about that. And so he kind of acknowledged what she was saying, but he still wasn't taking those tins of fish off the counter. Um, so she said, if you don't remove them, but she was like, I'm not leaving this shop until you remove them kind of thing. But if you don't remove them, I will tell everybody in the area to boycott your shop and not come here. I don't think she used the word boycott, but essentially that's what she was saying. She was going to stage a, 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 you know, a one-woman boycott and get everybody in the community involved. So he did remove them before she left that shop. Apartheid laws becoming part of our um, constitution as a South African um, nation, as a republic, happened in 1948. Yes, so that's when people say apartheid started, but that's not really true. Apartheid was made law in 1948. So by the time I got to my consciousness at four years old, it was just part of what we did, um, getting thrown out of your house because you were living in a very smart um, area where you could see the bay and the mountain and because that was then taken away under the Group Areas Act. So I was part of that where they divided people. This seemed to me to be the 
most powerful statement of a racist, which is to say, not only are we going to be racist, we're going to act our racism out in order to um, have state divisions and laws that made people uh, different, separate, second class, no class. It suddenly hit me that actually, if I was in South Africa with my mum and dad, my mom, mother who's black, my dad, father who's white, I couldn't actually go anywhere with either of them because I would be classified as coloured probably. Yeah? Um, and that would mean that the three of us would have to be separated and it would be illegal for us to be together. And although I was young, I kind of understood the horror of that without understanding the sort of legalities. So I think because of that, I just assumed this was a major thing everybody must know. And it actually took until I was at my second art school, um, you know, at the age of 19, I think, to discover, to my horror quite shock shockingly, that there were people who had no clue. I was coloured. A class is mixed. And... Uh, up to today, the Cape Town population is still way, way behind the rest of the country in their political advancement because we were regarded and were told that we were not black. We were part of, we were a white appendage. And they gave us this advantage to show that we were better by giving us things like running water, subsidized housing, uh, free schooling, um, electricity. I didn't know any of this. I didn't know that the people just on the other side of the bridge, bridges and rivers divided us that they were having a different experience. So like many white kids of my generation, we didn't know. We were quite comfortable and happy. We were living in a wattle and daub house. Um, and my dad was a school teacher. My mom was a machinist. So, you know, the class system has never really been part of Africa as such. You know, the, the severe class divisions. Um, but if you look at the uh, sub-working class, then we weren't that. Because we were, I would imagine a term that one can use is intelligent, intelligent here. You know, we were, were in a, which I think is the class system in South Africa, um, before the non-whites started trading and became entrepreneurs and stuff. So we, at our time, were part of the educated or aspirant educational class. My dad was a school teacher. The situation in South Africa was that I knew that we couldn't go and sit in a cafe or restaurant together. And this happened in a really fast moment where I think my dad just didn't think. And actually what it taught me at the time was, was, which I didn't know, I didn't term it in that way, or that phrase wasn't familiar to me at that time, but it is what it was, was white privilege. My dad had white privilege because he was used to going across the border, doing the business that he needed to do, and he could go and come. Nothing's going to happen to him. But he hadn't factored in that if he was with me, that it wouldn't work quite in the same way. Going to a shop to buy products was slightly different. And he said, probably people thought I worked for him. Yeah. So um, even though I was in my teens, probably for, you know, still like old enough to work or whatever, and I was some kind of assistant to him, which is really horrific anyway. Yeah. Um, but he just said, okay, it's lunchtime ready to eat now, you know, okay, let's go to this place. And I was trying to snatch up his arm and pull him back to say, hello, wait a minute, no, we can't. And he just hadn't thought about it. He forgot for a second. 
and he walked in before I could stop him. And we were in the doorway when this happened, and literally, you could hear a pin drop, complete silence from, you know, really lively, noisy restaurant, chatter, glasses, clinking, and all of that stuff, to complete silence. I didn't know about the suffering. We went to school and we were happy and we had food and we didn't do much, but we had a mountain and we had sea and we had... So I think sometimes the um, the impressions of poverty are falsified for the purposes of uh, for charitable purposes, because often those very kids that you see, you know, not wearing much, not having shoes, are on the unhappiest children they loved and they cared for within their circumstances. So I don't fall for this whole thing of, you know, poverty, poverty equals suffering. <laughs> no, no way. My young nephew, in he was born in the 70s, so it must have been in the 80s, sitting with me in the car, and we drove through Langa, our black area, and I remember him saying, Auntie Monica, what's wrong with these people? Everything's dark. There were no lights in the streets. And look at the streets. <laughs> he went. Oh, I remember that, and it's still in my head. We didn't know that. And that's a typical story of the privileged, the whites and the coloreds, honestly. No way. We didn't. We, we, we knew that we weren't as privileged as others, but that's part of society, isn't it? You don't always have everything. And we knew that the whites are superior. They've got everything. They've got these huge schools and, yeah, even churches. You weren't allowed to go into another denomination, same denomination, but you couldn't go to the black area. It was prohibited by law. Um, so you couldn't go into the areas at all without a permit. When there's disadvantage anywhere, women are disproportionately affected. Whether it's just poverty or loss of opportunities, um, issues around having to do childcare, or caring for elderly relatives, whatever it is. Um, so I think that I came from those rooms, the point of view of a feminist, and I was a very active feminist. So for me, the stories of women had not been as powerfully expressed, or as expressed, or at all expressed, mm -hmm. as much as those of the male exiles or people who were active um, in, when I say anti-party struggle, I mean in the Southern African region. But of course, women were highly involved, um, fully involved. It just wasn't something that emerged as much as the involvement of men. So for me, it became important that we um, focused on what the women's experiences were. Um, and those experiences were very important. A lot of women were involved in the domestic industry where they were, <coughs> excuse me, nannies, or worked in apartheid houses, um, and basically supported the white infrastructure as a result. So women are the, like the backbone of a family, you know, keeping everything together, um, um, having to work horrific jobs, women often having to work in white households as the only available work, you know, um, working in um, uh, servant type roles, cleaning, cooking, and actually having to look after children and often raise, you know, the, the children of white families. But um, then, not having the time for their own children and having to try and balance, um, have, have been forced to have to work long hours for minimal pay, and to walk long distances to, to get to work and then still manage their own household and have to face the impact of apartheid and whatever risk or danger their children might be facing, their partner, if they've got a husband or a partner, are facing as well. Um, so 
the, 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 the weight on their shoulders, I think, is really heavy. And in any time of um, conflict, women are often used as a weapon, aren't they? So there's also that, that, that issue as well that women face. Many of them were left at home in uh, areas which were quite rural because their husbands would move to be migrant workers in mines and other places and they would be left at home to carry, look after the family, look after their small farms if they had one. It was an enormous burden. Um, but women were very much the forefront of activities. The ANC, they were in, in Gondo Way, Sizway, and in every part of the ANC. So, and other anti-party activities, and then the United Democratic Front at the time. Um, powerful leaders, so it was important to get their voices out. Um, so that was, that was something that I felt was important for us to do in the anti-party movement, because it was quite... Uh, it, was, it was run by men, um, by and large, yeah, I am, I'm not saying exclusively so, but largely so at that time. When I became an industrial nurse, <laughs> they had an office in Cape Town in a factory. They had a factory and I was the factory nurse. We come on a Monday morning and this upstart, forget his name, he decided to divide the office up. In, t in keeping with apartheid. <laughs> so he, he put uh, these, you know, these dividers, uh, blacks there, coloreds there. <laughs> Honestly, with the door that closed, whites on the other side. We had to have our tea separately, and we couldn't mix. The shock and the disgust and the you know, the depth of apartheid was deeper. When it came to campaigning and sort of trying to explain what was happening into in South Africa um, and explaining the apartheid regime, having a real-life example of experiencing and seeing it and witnessing it firsthand resonated more with people because then they could put it into context that this was me, this was somebody they knew, um, that had seen and lived and experienced it, you know, even though that was about the second and nothing compared to what um, black and Asian people were suffering and experiencing in South Africa for their entire lifetime. Um, and I was talking about all of those things. I was talking about Steve Beaker and Nelson Mandela and everything else that was happening. But bizarrely, me using that example of seeing and hearing things for myself was the thing that resonated and people thought, oh, that, that's quite horrific. And they could relate to it more then. I think it made it more real. I've been there and I've seen it firsthand or I've experienced this firsthand. People do connect more and respond more. And that's why we do send, we don't send delegations, you know, to, to countries where there are human rights breaches for the fun of it you know, just to go and be tourists to what's happening. We do it so that we can use that experience to, to build um, uh, connections and solidarity and speak firsthand about what's happening and try and get, you know, um, galvanise uh, a wider pool of people to support 